In confronting some of Trinidad and Tobago's biggest challenges, Europe has put its hand up to help. From energy transition, to national security, to cybersecurity. But why the renewed interest in this part of the world post-pandemic? And is Trinidad and Tobago a welcoming environment for foreign investment? My guest this week, the European Commission's Latin America and Caribbean Director, Felix Fernandez Shaw. Mr. Felix Fernandez Shaw, welcome to the program. Welcome. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you in Trinidad and Tobago. You are the director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the European Commission. An interesting time to visit Latin America and particularly the Caribbean region. What do you hope to achieve? We started in July the first heads of state and government summit between the two regions in eight years. We hadn't met since 2015. And um, we thought, well, what interests the heads of summit, uh, the heads of government um, of Latin America, the Caribbean, and the European Union? And we all understood that what interests them is exactly the same. How do we project ourselves into the future? How do we green our economies and our societies? How do we digitalize them? And how we do it in a way that is protective, inclusive, and fair. And we uh, thought that looking at the um, struggle to transform and to transition in both regions was the same. One could say that the European Union is maybe ahead or maybe more ambitious, but you cannot underestimate the challenge of greening a whole society or digitalizing it with all the new challenges and all the new benefits that that entails. So what we did at the time is we presented an investment agenda that would lead both regions into the 21st century and thus showing to Latin America and the Caribbean what Europe could support in that, those two transitions but also showing Europe that Latin America and the Caribbean is a partner of choice for greening the economy and digitalizing the society. And that is something that we manage. Now, what I'm doing here, particularly in the Caribbean, where I've stayed for the past um, 10 days, is precisely looking at how European investors and governments are working together to promote these transitions, to promote sustainable infrastructure, renewable energy, green hydrogen, cyber security, etc., etc. What problems do they have? Uh, how can we, from the public side of Europe, the Commission, the member states, how can we unlock those investments? Because these are risky investments, new technologies. Um, we don't know how societies will respond to them. We have experience in that in Europe. It's difficult to all of a sudden change, pay for greening your economy. And that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out how the Trinidad and Tobago government, in a country where oil and gas is a main source of income and of export, how can we help the society and the government in their efforts to transition into a greener economy? When we talk about climate change and the need for energy transition, the major, most major focal point for us here in Trinidad and Tobago has to be CBAM. Uh, the carbon adjustment, uh, carbon border adjustment measures will directly affect us. Uh, we're one of the top countries, in fact, across the world that it will affect uh, us in Mozambique. Uh, I just wonder how much emphasis, or are we emphasizing too much on CBAM as opposed to looking at alternative sources of energy? Well, listen, I would say that Mozambique and Trinidad and Tobago are the two most affected countries by CBAM outside Europe. Because if you count Europe, you're probably 20, number 28 and number 29. Because in fact, CBAM is the external reflex of the internal greening of the European economy. What we are meeting here, and we're trying also to explain to the societies in Latin America and the Caribbean, is that our investors, people investing in Trinidad, um, and Tobago, people investing in Jamaica or in Brazil, 
they have a corporate obligation to green their economy and green their businesses. So they're going to be, hold, they're going to be held accountable in Europe for how much their global business is being greened. So when you come here and you understand that um, businesses like the hotels, like the um, uh, port infrastructure people management, all these people need to green. Precisely that impacts Europe as much as it impacts Trinidad and Tobago. As you say yourself, um, this is a future-oriented message a measure with a climate impact. Why are we doing this? Because we believe we have to push the societies to green. And yes, it is true that that impacts heavily uh, oil and gas economy like Trinidad and Tobago, but it also fosters and promotes the commitments of the government to go green. The government, Trinidad and Tobago as a country, has committed in the Paris Agreement to a certain decarbonization target. I just wonder, Mr. Fernandez, so uh, given what you are saying uh, with regards to CBAM and its impact on a country like Trinidad and Tobago, part of your trip here is to also work on trade relations between Europe and Trinidad and Tobago. What do you see uh, are the alternatives that Trinidad and Tobago can focus on? What are the opportunities for Trinidad and Tobago to focus on to export to Europe, a very important market for this country? Yeah. One of, the, one of the main reasons why CBAM impacts Trinidad and Tobago is because Trinidad is the largest uh, exporter of hydrogen and hydrogen-related products, ammonia, etc., to Europe. Um, conceptually, as I always say, and all the engineers, me being a lawyer, all the engineers laugh when I say, when you, need, when you have to produce green hydrogen, you need water, you need wind or sun, and you need an industry. You have here all those things. The most costly part of that effort is the industry, which you have. Last but not least, conceptually going from grey hydrogen to green hydrogen is about changing the plug in which you're, publing, you're plugging your hydrogen producing industry. Therefore, uh, one of the main efforts that I think the government and ourselves with technology are looking for is how do we continue producing hydrogen in Trinidad but we slowly go from grey to green and what is the kind of renewable energy source that adapts? Is it solar? Is it wind? Is it geothermal? For example, we've worked with the government on analyzing the wind in the southern canal between Trinidad and the continent there's enormous potential um, of wind capacity there to produce the renewable energy to power a hydrogen producing plant. I just wonder, Mr. Fernandez, so given the conversations that have taken place at COP28 and at the energy conference here last week, uh, I know that you would have been in the Caribbean, probably read some of it in the newspapers. The, the thrust towards green hydrogen in Trinidad and Tobago. The conversations are there, but the action isn't. And I just wonder if you feel the European Union is the fuel that can really push this country into that green hydrogen space. I, I am not, I, I would say, I would not like to appear to be that arrogant as we are the fuel, but I like the way you say it. Um, in any case, we are ready, and that's part of what I'm doing here, and what Europe wants to do, we are ready to unlock the technology that allows countries to transit from grey to green. If you look at, for example, this little piece that we have here, this is the Global Gateway Investment Agenda for Latin America and the Caribbean. If you look at what says here Trinidad and Tobago, it says, says, facilitate shift from grey to green hydrogen through a transition to renewable energy, offshore wind and solar. This is what we're doing, but that costs money. It takes investments, it takes technology, it takes risk. People have to come here with their technology and risk capital to work on a technology that we're all experimenting with. Coming up next, what it would take to green TNT's economy. On greening the economy, 
there are a certain number of um, energy markets, electricity markets, reforms that need to happen. So for the people of Trinidad and Tobago listening to this conversation, uh, is it then, for them, is it then that the EU, the European Commission to be exact in your trip here, is willing to invest that, 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 uh, that, the, that money, that capital that you talk about that is so critically needed to make green energy a reality? We are willing to invest the, the funds we have and rally around us the member states that have funding to, let's say, produce that result you're talking about through different actions. First action is unlocking the risk that comes with the investment in these frontier technologies, the first mover's risk. It's also the first mover's benefit, but first thing is a risk. You bet on something that's new, you're risking. We know for a fact in Europe that this is happening. So we're doing in Europe nothing different than what we want to do in Trinidad, is support with public funding, people who are willing to risk their capital and their technology to try new solutions. We have also have conversations with the government and we're starting to have conversations all over the Caribbean on, let's say, the jobs of the future. If you're going to green your economy, in the next 20 years you are going to need to have technicians that work all along the value chain on sustainability assessments, electricians, people that manage power plants, people that manage the software that goes with it, uh, people that do feasibility studies, all these kinds of things bring jobs. It's not only the management of the plants, it's all the ecosystem that runs with it. Greening an economy means also greening manufacturing industry, all kinds of you know, energy and non-energy related. This brings jobs. For those jobs to have people, we need to train the people. And in order to train the people, we're willing to work together with the government and with our investors to organize um, vocational training for people who will want to work in those areas. Otherwise, the two big problems for any investment normally are uh, the risk, the financial risk, but also having a workforce that can develop your business or your technology locally. We are trying to have a triangle government, EU investors and European Union public funding to unlock that work. I, 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 you as the director for the Latin America and Caribbean region, Mr. Fernandez, so I just wonder, uh, having been doing this for a few years now, what are the hurdles and the challenges uh, that you've been meeting across particularly the Caribbean? Well, I would say the first one is the one everybody knows when you come to Caribbean is a structural issue, is the size of the market and the fragmentation of the market. Um, all investors tell me that it takes them the same effort in times of human resources, work, etc., etc., to build a gigantic plant in Brazil and a Trinidad size or a St. Lucia size plant in the Caribbean. It takes the same amount of work, but of course the yield and the benefits are completely different. So the first job that we have and that I'm here to, to, to work on is to push European investments to come to the Caribbean. Of course these are not going to be the big global companies, but there are plenty of mid-sized companies that are already working in the Caribbean that we want to unlock their investments and help them stay or come anew to the Caribbean. Do you find the, the environment healthy and welcoming for those that you are trying to encourage to invest in the region? Um, I think the Caribbean is quite well positioned in terms of attracting investment. But for example, on greening the economy, there are a certain number of um, energy markets, electricity market reforms that need to happen. Because as happens in Europe, uh, the electricity market in Europe was liberalized a couple of decades ago. It was only the transmission that was stayed in public hands, but the rest of the, of the, of the energy business was liberalized. 
Uh, it's difficult to do that when you are a group of islands because it's difficult to, to liberalize. Nevertheless, we find that a whole conversation between governments, uh, energy utilities and investors need to happen because there's always a transition. And in that transition, there is financing, there's regulation, there is investment and technology. And that's another hurdle that we need to look at. I think the third hurdle, of course, is the fact that there is a greenium. So if you are producing electricity with one technology, which is fossil fuel, and you need to shift into another technology, which is renewable, it comes with a cost to do the same thing you were doing before, which is to produce electricity. Now, that cost in the long term will be a benefit for health, for the planet, for importing fuels. Um, but at the same time, we need to address it now because the high cost is at this end. It's not at the, at the future end, it's at the short term end. That's the other thing we're trying to do. We're trying to bring investors and governments together and use our funding to support these unlocking elements. Fourth, of course, is the workforce. Um, if, you, um, if, you want to, if you want to green your economy, you're going to need a whole lot of people that know what they're talking about and that are able to operate plants, the software, or give an analysis or an assessment. I, I, we've talked a lot about uh, green energy and greening the economy. One of the things that you are also focused on on this trip is security across the Caribbean region, a very important topic, uh, particularly uh, crime and the transshipment of uh, guns and ammunition. Uh, it is on the rise. But another key aspect of security is cybersecurity, uh, something that Europe is coming face to face with as we speak. Um, where is your thoughts on the Caribbean region? And I was reading uh, just in the newspaper a couple of days ago about 60% of Trinidad and Tobago businesses are vulnerable to cyber attacks. Yeah, well, um, wow. Um, that is about 17 questions in one question. So let's go one, one after the other. First of all, on, uh, on security. We have just um, enlarged, we're going to launch, I think it's next month in Panama, uh, we're going to launch El Pacto uh, and we're going to launch it in the Caribbean. El Pacto is the second edition of this, of this uh, uh, European Union program with, five, with four member states. The second edition of the program is going to combine eight member states and is going to be implemented for the first time in the Caribbean. And the reason for that is this is a program that brings together police officers, prosecutors and judges from both sides of the Atlantic, uh, Latin America, Caribbean and Europe for the first time in the Caribbean and is also going to bring for the first time, we were doing it with four member states, uh, Spain, France, Italy and Portugal and we're now enlarge, enlarging it to Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany. The reason for this is that we believe that the officials in charge of fighting crime should talk to each other, not only for training, not only for uh, standard protocols, but also for real operations. But in order to do that, you need to understand each other's environment, but you also need to have contacts and you need to develop trust among institutions. This is what El Pacto does, is try to bring together the practitioners against crime, not the practitioners on crime. This, we have plenty of other people doing it. We do practitioners against crime that come together and, and try to build trust to be able to fight crime in a better, in a, more efficient, in a more efficient way. So the authorities in Trinidad and Tobago overseeing national security could potentially, through this program, have the help of those from Italy, uh, from France, from Belgium? It's not a could have potentially, it's a will have for sure. Because that's what the enlargement of the program to the Caribbean means is that now, for example, the federal office or the office of the prosecutor in Trinidad and Tobago can have a twinning program or can speak to the office of the German prosecutor. So that, that's what it does. Up next, why the renewed interest in the Caribbean post-pandemic? Um, that's a good question. Why?
given, sorry, and I'm sorry to cut you in, Absolutely. but given the different challenges that uh, are faced across the Atlantic, the different constitutional systems, uh, do you, how do you think uh, uh, this could potentially work in our favor? Well, it, it, it is a very complicated issue, but the fact of life is there are the people who protect the law and the people who violate the law. Um, and this, the institutions on both sides of the Atlantic understand it very well. Then, yes, you need to understand that in some countries the prosecutor has centered competences, that in other countries it's the police or it's the judge. All this complicates the matter, but that's what this program is meant to do, is to create the understanding and to know that if you want to prosecute someone in Trinidad and Tobago, it's the police you need to talk to, or the judge, or the prosecutor. Whereas in Spain, it's a different set of, of it depends. We are fully uh, respectful of every country's distribution of competences to fight crime. But what we want is to bring people together to, to be more efficient in combating crime. But I don't, want to, um, I don't want to forget your last set of questions, particularly on cybersecurity. Um, which is different from cybercrime. It's a, it's a, it's a, they are both related because they both work online, but it's a different kind of story. As a country with plenty of industrial infrastructure, Trinidad and Tobago must be ready for, the future, uh, for a future cyber world and has to be of cybersecurity infrastructure. What we are working in the, uh, in the European Union precisely is to building an enhanced system of cooperation among the 27 member states and the 27 cybersecurity authorities who work hand in hand with the private sector. Why? Because in the digital sphere, the private sector is as interested as the public sector to make sure that the products they sell and the services they provide are fully secure for their clients. And on this the public and the private in Europe try to work together also to stay at the edge of the technological development because hackers are constantly moving around. This is something that we want to work uh, with Latin America and the Caribbean on. There are some countries that are really advanced in this regard and partnering with Europe would allow us to enhance the capacity to prevent and protect against cyber hacking both of people, services, companies and, and infrastructure. However, the first thing we need to agree, and I think on this we all agree fully, um, and, and we, we, I think we've shared that by signing in the summit the EU-LAC Digital Alliance, which is one of the uh, uh, projects that I showed you, uh, we fully agree in both sides of the Atlantic that technology serves people and protects people and not the other way around. And this is something that is pretty very clear in the eyes of Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean. But then we need to drill down what that means. And what that means is that we need to build secure infrastructure, one that keeps the data where the data belongs. And the data belongs to the people. The data belongs to the company. The information belongs to the investors or the public institutions that generate them. They do not belong to the people running the service. And this is very important in today's times because we are seeing some different approaches to what cybersecurity is, to what 5G can do now that we're trying to connect people and things. It's very important to remain with trusted vendors and with 5G secure uh, connectivity. We've had a number of uh, EU officials uh, visit Trinidad and Tobago over the last few months. I've been privileged through the Commission uh, to speak to a number of them, now including yourself, and I just wonder uh, why the renewed interest in the Caribbean post-pandemic? Um, well, that's a good question. Why? Um, well, as I said, the summit in July gave us the opportunity to come together and gave some of us who really love Latin America and the Caribbean, to try and bring to a Europe worried by the post-pandemic, by Ukraine and the war Russia is waving on Ukraine, by a whole lot of, you know, uh, geopolitical things, try to bring to the attention of Europe, here you have a region that is frankly 
you know, a region that thinks and has a, a view of society and development which is very similar to the European. Let's not forget that the Sustainable Development Goals were born in Latin America and in the Caribbean. And it's the GRULAC group in the UN that pushed the whole sustainability agenda. So what we think about the Caribbean is that we need to be supportive also because the Caribbean is widely affected by climate change because the structural problems that the Caribbean has are very difficult to surmount without a bit of support. But also, uh, if you exclude Trinidad and Tobago, and maybe apologies for that, if you start looking at the possibility for the Caribbean to power its own future, all you need again is sun, water, wind and industry. So Trinidad and Tobago has the industry, the rest of the, of the Caribbean has sun and water and everything. This could be a fantastic way to make the Caribbean power independent. And therefore, why miss the opportunity? I think the other self-interest in this operation is that while Europe greens itself uh, on an agenda on, where, on which we have been the leaders, but we're not the only ones. We find in Latin America and the Caribbean a formidable partner. One that believes in the green agenda, struggles with it, of course, like everyone else, but believes fully in the green agenda. So it doesn't make any sense that um, uh, Europe greens itself and the rest of the world goes in a different way. What makes sense is that our partners and our friends, those who see the world in the same way as we see it, work together with us to transit into the new, you know, planetary, respectful um, societies. Mr. Felix Fernandez Shaw, you're in Trinidad and Tobago for 24 hours and you gave me half hour of your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure. Thanks a lot for the opportunity.